Hi there, welcome to ITY TV. Today we're speaking again with Tony Maguire, Regional Director for Australia and New Zealand for D2L. Thank you, Tony. Nice seeing you again. Pleasure, David. It's great to see you again, too. It's been a little while since we've chatted. Yes, too long. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so Absolutely. It's a challenging time at the moment, isn't it? And, um, you know, organisations really have to do something special to stand out in this challenging job market by providing quality learning and development programs, I believe. That's what we want to talk about. So I guess, you know, I guess my first question is, why are organisations in Australia struggling to find enough talent? Yes, I think there's three reasons for that, David. The first is the changing expectations for employees, particularly as we came out of COVID. People had a different view as to what work-life balance meant for them, what happiness meant for them. So I think that impacted on uh, their aspirations in a sense. The second thing which changed was choice. I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago and uh, the CEO of the Grattan Institute, Danielle Wood, was speaking and she talked about the fact that having uh, an unemployment rate below 4% meant a couple of interesting things that really haven't occurred before. The first is anyone who wants a job probably has one. And the second is some people who were otherwise on the fringes of the of the labour market, young people looking for their first job, uh, people with disability, living with disability, older workers or long-term unemployed, now had access to opportunities that, were te that tended to be closed to them before. So choice uh, has, has, has really popped up. I think the last thing is something that's really just happened in the last month or so. So I think there's some, some currency to this, this point. Um, if you look in the tech space, you've seen companies like Twitter uh, uh, and others uh, cull their workforce, well, Facebook's another, but also there's, there's ed techs out there, educational technology companies like FutureLearn, like Coursera, who are also going through uh, uh, right-sizing. I hate that word, but that's the word that, that's used, right-sizing their businesses. Now, I think every ed tech vendor and technology more broadly is experiencing those contractions as maybe the expectations for business after COVID didn't align with what's actually happened over the last 12 months. So there's a bit of realignment there. So I think those three elements have spoken to that tightness. Yeah, brilliant. No, I appreciate those insights. That's interesting. So I guess given that then with organisations struggling for those reasons, I guess what can they do to differentiate themselves in this challenging job market? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things that you need to think about. What we used to do in terms of workplace perks has changed. So having a slide and uh, and um, you know catered lunches was good. Uh but we've now got a hybrid work culture. So what do you do? How do you uh, refocus on uh, on those, those, those perks, I guess, that make sense? So I think the first one is proof that you're investing in your staff. Uh, it's, that's something that sets employers apart, particularly when you're going through a recruitment process and applicants are wanting to know what you do. I think there's three, focus, uh, three things there. The first is focus on well-being. So embracing staff agency. And that term agency is something I've seen come up more and more uh, in conversations with CEOs, uh, with employers, particularly in the learning space, the sense of agency. So employee or learner choice, um, being able to exercise that choice in an equitable way and then apply that choice to their career aspirations. So well-being is really fundamental to that uh, because if you're, you're focusing on those things and you're building resilience and you're helping to close the gap in emotional and mental health support issues. The second, I think, is building community. So if we're not going to have those lunches anymore, catered, how do we build community? Um, and that really does come down to the, the way that you uh, nurture um, uh, practice and support for your community of, of, of employees in different ways. How do you check in with them on a regular basis, not just through uh, pulse checks, but deeper, more um, proactive nudges uh, and, and touches that can come from technology. Um, and I think the last thing is around the digital tools um, and the enablement kinds of activities that you put in place. So you've got to have clear expectations with your employees. Uh, they have to have some sense of ownership over the systems and the tools as well. So it's more than just platform training or support services. You need to actually have them invest. Again, that comes back to agency. Have we asked them the questions? 
that are important for them to actually be able to access systems. And I think the last thing then is how do you actually then work with them, having got those uh, those feedback loops in place and got that that data, how do you then start to co-design and co-create uh, those activities, environments, or whatever is needed to actually then support uh, staff wellbeing and growth? Sure. Actually, I like what you say about community. You know, I mean, we talk about this hybrid way of working and, you know, you can be in the office some days and not, but I tell you what, sometimes it's just so depressing, the sort of driving into the office, going into a room just to spend the whole day on Zoom anyway. So, so yeah, I like that idea of community. That's, that's it. You're right. Instead of lunch, it's, you know, how do we get everybody engaged? So I guess... Following on from that then, so why is it important for companies to offer learning and development in particular to employees? Um, I think if you have the right learning and development programs in place, there's a couple of things that flow out of that. The first is you're able to more effectively attract the right candidates. I can't tell you how many roles we've tried to fill over the last couple of years and the quality of candidate has been very patchy. Uh, because people have choice, they'll have a crack for something which is maybe two or three uh, steps above their current role. And they're, they're, they're pitching themselves for almost for a, for a what if. What if I can uh, land this? Um, I think the second thing that comes from having a really solid learning and development culture in place is you're seen as an employer of choice. So now the attraction of, of candidates is a little bit more filtered. If I'm going to have a crack at these guys, I want to make sure I'm on my best uh, on my best game. And I think the last thing, if you have strong learning and development, you have a, actually had a, a, a think about how you then move candidates through the process quickly. Um, speed of of movement through the process is what undoes a lot of companies. If you're not responding back to people within four to eight hours, you've probably lost that candidate. I have to say, that's probably been one of my biggest learnings, uh, where we could get away with response within 12 hours, uh, one working day, that's now no longer the case. If you want the candidate, you have to move quickly and you have to have the right structures in place, set the right expectations and have the right programs in terms of learning and career aspirations in place. That's, that's Yeah, thanks, Tony. That's interesting. So I guess then how can learning and training technologies such as learning management systems be differentiators when attracting and retaining staff? Mm. I think there's probably two pieces to that. First of all, the platform itself. With Brightspace, we think about accessibility as the starting point for use of, use of the platform. So what are the ways in which we build a fully um, accessible learning uh, learning um, platform, mobile first, ensuring that the content that's created is actually deployable to the widest variety of learners. So we talked earlier about people uh, living with disability, maybe accessing opportunities they didn't have before. It's incumbent upon every employee to make sure that the experiences that employees and aspirants um, experience as they come through um, their process speaks to their unique uh, accessibility needs. So that's the first thing. Does the platform provide access? The second thing I think is important goes beyond platform is how does the platform and the vendor allow you to access quality content? So I'll give an example here. With uh, my company D2L, uh, we provide uh, an employee training and professional development program called WAVE. It's been released in North America. Our employees here, my team here in Australia, have access to that now. It provides $4,500 every year for employees to take programs. Those programs can be from short course or longer forms of learning, but it is, going back to agency again, their choice to uh, identify, uh, find, and then complete the training that means something to them. So one of my team at the moment is doing something around data. Someone else is doing something around negotiation skills. So short course negotiation skills or a longer course a university subject in, in data. Either way, the platform provides access to that 
the partnership that D2L has with those universities or those uh, quality uh, uh, content curation companies is really important because the content isn't just doing um, short course commercial content pieces. This is stuff that gives you recognition that can yes. be rewarded and actually contributes to your career growth. So that's that's the important piece, I think. Platform is important, but what are those relationships and partnerships which allow your staff to get the best training that's recognisable and rewardable? Hmm, that's awesome. Okay, that's terrific, Tony. So I guess going further on that, then why should the employers be incorporating lifelong learning opportunities to nurture talent? Well, the first, the first answer to that is uh, employee stickiness. Uh, you want to, as I said before, uh, recognise uh, their career pathways, their aspirations, help them, support them to achieve those aspirations and then reward them when they achieve those. So platforms can do that in really easy ways, automating a lot of the uh, access, delivery, um, uh, assessment of, uh, of learning. It can issue badges. So the automation side is important because it takes the onus off back office operations to actually manage a lot of this stuff. It also means that the employee can engage as and when they want to. The second thing I think is really important is um, uh, the productivity uh, 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 improves because you have a deeper and a, a broader understanding of your workforce development. So where are the, where are the spaces where your employees of the workforce are improving, getting better? Where are the gaps? How do you mitigate those gaps? How do you leverage those uh, maturing skill sets? And then once you've got that data, that's kind of rolls in the last piece, which is you take that evidence, you take that data, now that informs your strategy and it supports your business viability. You know where, to, where, where you need to grow, uh, your, your skill sets, you know where particular campaigns to build capability are important, but you also know where you've got um, an abundance of skills that perhaps give you a competitive advantage. Yeah, okay. No, that's interesting. That really is. That's good advice for companies. I guess specifically then about your company. So I guess what does D2L offer that can help overcome these recruitment challenges for Australian organisations? I think the first thing that we do to position ourselves as somewhat different to many of our, uh, our other uh, tech uh, brothers and sisters is very much around thought leadership. So we do a lot of work, uh, not just media pieces like this, where we're talking about our findings and, re and research, but we do invest in research. We absolutely uh, focus on being at the table for key conversations that are of import uh, across the Australian economy. A couple of examples there. Uh, a couple of months ago, uh, we were lucky enough to be at the TAFE Goes to Parliament session. So we were working with TAFE leadership there to understand the impact of uh, the um, a new skills framework and policy coming out of federal government that was going to be affecting um, uh, TAFE in particular. Because at the end of the day, these guys have been producing micro-credentials, skills and training packages, if you like, for years. So if we are to actually fill the, uh, the skills and, uh, uh, and, and uh, employee gaps, TAFE is absolutely fundamental to that. That's not to say that, that uh, for profit uh, and private providers don't have a role. What I'm seeing is a bigger pie that everybody needs to contribute to. So that's the first one. The second one is, I think, having conversations with higher education and employers together, bringing those sorts of conversations together. I'll give you a couple of examples shortly, uh, where we're seeing the, the disconnect between higher education and employers uh, is being uh, sort of mitigated in a sense. I'll give you a couple of examples. We've recently run some face-to-face -face sessions where we have brought industry, uh, TAFE and higher education together in round table and fireside chats with, um, with, with attendees. So we have CEOs coming in from uh, various businesses. We've got... Uh, HR directors, learning and teaching uh, leads coming in to participate, contribute to, and 
uh, take learnings away from these 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 round tables and some of those have been posted up on the web but um, we talked the most recent one was where we talked about the value of micro credentials from the classroom to the boardroom so the information that was packed into that was very much from uh, higher education industry uh, and um, and the TAFE perspectives and how those learnings can actually start to fill those skills gaps that we've got. Yeah, right. Yep. Uh, the other thing uh, that's uh, uh, really critical is the, how the platforms then are used to drive the skills explosion. So Queensland TAFE, for instance, uh, on any given day, you've probably got a couple hundred thousand learners going through their micro-credentials uh, framework, they're uh, engaging with a whole variety of content. But the way that they're structured, it's really interesting. It's single click. So almost replicating a commercial or a, con or a consumer approach to, to knowledge. One click, I'm enrolled, I'm good to go. We try to minimize the steps between what the learner wants to achieve and getting into the content. Okay. Yeah, interesting. No, that's fascinating what d is doing. I suppose, Tony, we've talked about a lot of things, but I guess... You know, if, if you were to distill it, if, if um, you know, a company were to say, look, Tony, I'm a CEO and trying to, you know, what can I do? You know, is there one piece of advice that absolutely you could give me as a company trying to make my business an attractive proposition to, uh, you know, to, to potential employees? I guess, you know, what would be the key advice you could give somebody? Yeah, culture, culture, culture. That focus on well-being and actually having that resonate honestly, through the business, that sense of community and how we build that from a hybrid sense. And you have to think about those various components now that weren't even on the radar two years ago. And you really do have to think about are those spaces where communities, teams come together and problem solve. Because typically, if your teams are coming together effectively, they're, they're solving those problems uh, more effectively for you. And then the last thing I think, which is really, again, part of culture, is around the digital tools and the enablement. How do you best leverage digital tools with the lowest sets of hurdles for users uh, and ensure that your enablement, your um, skilling of, of employees in their role, but also more broadly to provide value to the business, um, how, how do you use those digital tools to make them all happen effectively? And that's really what we try to do with our clients. Yeah, fantastic. No, that's brilliant advice. I appreciate that a lot. That's wonderful. Thank you again, Tony, for your time. It's always great talking to you. Absolute pleasure, David. Thank you. Um, have a great holiday period. Yes, you too. No, thank you. So that's Tony McGuire, Regional ANZ Director for D2L. Thank you, Tony, and yeah, happy Christmas and happy new year. <laughs> thank you.